Hi, so welcome to the stream today. Really excited for having you on our second episode this week as we continue with the discussion in respect of public private partnership arrangement so on monday we started with a discussion and we looked at the principles we discussed the overview of ppp looked at the principles spent some time to look at the types of the public private partnership arrangement so what i want to get myself into discussion in respect of so what i want to get myself into today is to touch on the various other minor issues that we are left with that the examiner can access a question about i see some of you guys joining you are welcome any questions you have you can put them in the chat for me i'm reading i'm going to be reading all your comments and providing you with answers in respect of any questions that you have so leave any question you have in the comment section for me remember to also share the video let us reach as many students as possible watching the stream so let me bring up my slide quickly and let's get excited into the discussion so as mentioned monday in the part one we started with the whole discussion on public private partnership arrangement give me a sec like my slide is okay there we go so we started with a whole discussion on public private partnership arrangement uh, discuss the issue about the principles that we have to take into consideration when it comes to dealing with the public private partnership arrangement and so like i said we want to just touch on some few things left in the syllabus generally in respect of this particular topic so i'm going to primarily be coming in from my book on public sector when it comes to this particular discussion because a lot of the things that i want to talk to you about are generally here so i'm going to be presenting directly from my book and then we'll discuss it from there so the other issue that we have to talk about is what are the objectives of ppp so the public private partnership policy what is its objective what does it seek to achieve generally couple of points are available here number one is that it is there to leverage public assets and funds with private sector resources from local and international market to accelerate needed investment in infrastructure and services because again like i told you in the part one we mentioned that about 90 percent of the tax that we pay goes into running the machinery of government so the day-to-day -day running of the machinery of government 90 percent of the taxes go in there now the loans do not enough to be able to cover all of these things and so there is going to be delay in the provision of the needed infrastructure facilities for economic development so the ppp policy came in so that the government can then leverage on the funding available the funding sources in the private sector to accelerate the provision of the needed infrastructure facilities and services so that we can increase the standard of living of the citizens so that is the first thing we need to understand the key one objective is to accelerate needed investment in infrastructure and services two is en to encourage and facilitate investment by the private sector by creating as enabling or an enabling environment for ppp where value for money for governments can clearly demonstrate okay so that is the second thing to encourage and facilitate investment by the private sector because again private sector is the driving force for each economy yes although we say that for the most part in developing countries and some selected developed countries the government is the largest employer nonetheless the private sector is a key player when it comes to economic development now how do we bring in the private sector to help in all of these things that we need to look out for and that is where the public private partnership policy comes in so it is to encourage and facilitate investment by the private sector three is to increase the availability of public infrastructure and services and improve service quality and efficiency of projects so not only are we accelerating so that we have it as fast as possible but also to increase the availability of public infrastructure if you remember we spoke about one of the 
models or type of public private partnership arrangement and that was mo maintain and operate as well as se which is service concession in either case we made mention of the fact that the infrastructure is already there the asset is already there but it is not productive it is not operating to its capacity there is a lot of inefficiency in the system so the private sector is brought in to improve the quality of the service and the efficiency of the project and that is also another key objective that a ppp seek to achieve and definitely to protect the interests of all stakeholders including end users affected people government and the private sector so the policy is to protect the interests of all stakeholders so that again yes if we leave the thing in the hands of just a private sector entity to come in to carry or to provide the infrastructure facility they can charge any amounts they want to charge but remember uh, in the episode one we discussed that one of the key principles underlining the public private partnership arrangement is the ability to pay and we can only have that in a framework like the public private partnership arrangement so these are some of the things that a public private partnership policy seek to achieve accelerating the needed inf uh, investment in infrastructure encouraging the private sector so they can begin to provide whatever service that they have to provide increasing the availability of infrastructure facilities but most importantly improving the efficiency that is very important and then protecting the interests of all stakeholders now so if you look at the objectives you just tweak it a little bit and that tells us about the benefits or the importance of the public private partnership arrangement because if we look at the benefits of public private partnership arrangement then what is going to be happening is that one it accelerates delivery of what needed infrastructure facilities so let's say we want road we want hospitals we want schools if we say that we should wait for the government so that they save from the 10 pesos 10 pesos of every one ghana city tax we pay before they undertake the infrastructure facility it will not be done and it will not be available as soon as possible so what do we do through public private partnership arrangement that is fast, uh, accelerated two it encourages the private sector to provide innovative design technology and financing structure because if you remember again in the episode one we made mention of the fact that under the boo for instance build own and operate another one district one factory policy what is happening is that government is just step stepping in looking at the policy of the entity the uh, entrepreneur the business owners and the government just direct you to the finance provider and the finance provider bring in and all of the finance providers for the most part are largely public uh, private sector entities so it's encouraging the private sector to come in with a financing structure and all the needed things that we have then increase international and domestic investment very true very very true because a lot of the roads that will be constructed hospitals that will be constructed all of the various projects that will be undertaken under the ppp is to increase investment which is what is needed uh, because that will help us for the most part to help to increase the standard of living of the citizens provide the needed infrastructure facilities and add to our gdp as a country at the end of the day then risk sharing by government with the private sector partners again this is one of the key principles under the public private partnership arrangement we made mention of the fact that um the party with a requisite skill will be mandated to manage the risk associated with whatever we are dealing with and so we spoke about the issue in respect of construction risks financial risk availability risks maintenance risks residual risks all of these are risks that are going to be associated with the project so if government alone undertakes it then government is going to be bearing the risks entirely if a private sector entity also undertakes the project solely then they are going to be their ones bearing the risks but through the ppp policy there is a shared risk between the government as well as the private investor and that encourages more investments to be undertaken so these are some of the benefits that we can share our thoughts on when it comes to dealing with public private partnership arrangement okay the guiding principle we've already spoken about that so no need to go there limitations 
in as much as this whole policy is fantastic i mean who wouldn't wouldn't do this that hey governments want to expand infrastructure facility provision and so what does government do government brings in the private investors and then they're able to undertake the project so although it's a good policy there are some limitations and as always anything that involves government and the private sector there is going to be some level of limitations that we have to know about the first one is that not pro all projects are feasible not all projects are feasible why because of political legal commercial viability etc so government may have a nice project but no private sector will be interested in coming into it why because of some political uh reasons or somebody may even bid to undertake the project but because the person has never supported the government in power or maybe the ceo or somebody in that company spoke ill in the past against you know the government they are likely not to be getting the project so all the not all projects are feasible there number two the private sector may not take interest in projects due to perceived high risks lack of technical and financial and managerial capacity to impl implement the project there are some projects that are very risky and although yes the higher the risk the higher the returns sometimes if the private investors look at the risk associated with the project and the returns that it, it promises it's not worth to be undertaking so they're going to be ignoring that at the end of the day another thing that we can talk about is that um some projects may be more politically or socially challenging to introduce and implement than others that's also another limitation that we can talk about so the limitation is a lot i mean that we can talk about then government responsibility continues that's also another thing that we can talk about in that particular case so there are a lot of limitations that we can talk about another typical example is the change in government and discontinuation of projects which is a character in this part of the world especially in ghana here because i mean a new government comes and for the most part 99.9 percent .9 of the time the projects that the previous government was undertaking they will not celebrate it they will not continue with the project and so you go around the country and the factories the schools the buildings that the previous administration was working on this administration would you want to work on it to complete the project why because they feel that oh if they finish and launch the project the the opposition will pick it up and say oh it is our project we did it and so because of the political score and the fact that there is lack of continuity for the most part in public sector projects many projects are not able to be undertaken generally and these are some of the limitations that we can talk about like i said the list is very tall i mean generically if you think about the whole idea about public private partnership arrangement anything that involves the government and the private sector we can talk about some limitations there certainly there could be some level of corruptions at the end of the day because um certain entities may get the opportunity to be selected not because they have the capacity to expand on their projects or whatever the heck it is but you know because they are just associated with the government in power or related with the government in power sometimes that could be another limitation that we need to look out for and talk about generally so these are some of the issues we can talk about in respect of the limitations okay in respect of the limitations the types we've already spoken about that so let me jump straight up into exemptions now the fact that public private partnership arrangement means government doing a business with a private sector to execute a project does not mean any time that we involve the private sector entity it is a public private partnership arrangement no so this is an area that the examiner you know it's it's been lurking in the syllabus so i don't know it's an area that the examiner could uh, spend some time on with you if he's excited about the exam and that is exemptions of public private partnership in ghana the following are not covered 
under PPP arrangements. In other words, we cannot refer to them as public-private partnership arrangements. The first one is divestiture or privatization of state-owned enterprises. When we privatize a state-owned enterprise, it is not a public-private partnership. It is called a sale. We've sold the business. Okay, so if we sell as a, a public entity to a private entity, that is privatization. That is not a public-private partnership arrangement. We've sold it, we have taken the money, and we'll use the money to do something else. So that is outside the public-private partnership scope. Two, outsourcing of government services without transfer of risks to a private sector over a significant period. Stay with me. Remember we spoke about maintain and operate but as a model under the public-private partnership arrangement. But we said under the maintain and operate, it is usually a short period of time, say five years. What we are saying here is that if government still outsource a certain responsibility to a private sector entity to do, and they do it over a significant period of time, however, there is no transfer of risks to them. In other words, they are still going to be agents. Then certainly that is not going to be seen as a public-private partnership arrangement. It's outside the scope of public-private partnership arrangement. Three, the grant of any mineral rights under the Mineral Act, whether it involves the direct or indirect participation of the public entity. So we give a mineral right to an individual. Someone comes and says, hey, I want to uh, explore Okay, I want to go and undertake some reconnaissance. Then I will explore. Then I will start mining. If the public sector entity is participating in that as well, that is not a public-private partnership arrangement. That's a different thing. It's a joint venture arrangement, and that is outside the public-private partnership scope. It's outside the scope of public-private partnership. Then procurement of goods, works, and services. When we go and buy goods, let's say Ghana Education Service or Ghana Health Service want to buy some sanitary pads, some condoms, and other after morning pills. If they go, they want to procure those things, they're going to procure them in accordance with the Public Procurement Act, 2003 Acts amended. That is not public private partnership. If government comes to buy something from me, that doesn't mean we are doing public private partnership arrangements. So, procurement of goods is also not a public private partnership arrangement. So, these are some transactions, events, and circumstances which may look like the government is doing a business with a private investor or a pri the private sector, but we cannot say it is a public-private partnership arrangement. That is what you must understand about the exemptions of public-private partnership in Ghana. All right. Then we come to the IAS 32. Remember in the session one, I told you that service concession, IAS 32 gives guidelines on how we should recognize assets under service concession. And again, if you remember, I told you that for some reason, service concession is an area that the examiner has been really excited about. And so IAS, did I say IAS? IPSAS 32, that is International Public Sector Accounting Standards 32, gives guidelines on how we should account for service concession arrangement. And the grantor, which is going to be the operating entity or the contracting entity, would have to recognize assets under certain circumstances. So under which conditions should a grantor recognize a service concession asset? So the grantor shall recognize an asset provided by the operator or an upgrade of an existing asset of the grantor as a service concession if the grantor controls or regulates what services the operator must provide with the asset, to whom it must be provided, and at what price. So if Ghana government undertakes a service concession, like for instance, I told you about the fact that this one typical example of service concession is the... PDS deal here in Ghana when PDS came to take over the electricity company of Ghana. That was a service concession arrangement and you know what that stands out to be. So if governments can regulate how they are supposed to carry out their services, what they are supposed to charge through PURC and 
who they are supposed to serve, then government will still be recognizing what? The assets under the service concession. And two, the grantor, which is the contracting entity, which is the public sector entity, which is the government, controls through ownership, beneficial entitlement or otherwise, any significant residual interest in the asset at the end of the terms of agreement. So, as far as government is going to be getting the residual interest in the asset at the end of whatever agreed term it is, be it 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, government can recognize the assets in the books of the government. So that is EPSAS 32, the circumstances under which we can recognize an asset from the government perspective. So two key things, government regulating how they do their things, whom they sell to, at what price. Number two, government has some controlling interest either through ownership or in uh, the residual assets at the end of the agreed term. But in addition to this recognition in the financial statement, it's going to be some disclosure in the notes. And so the grantor, which is a contracting entity, must make the following disclosures in the notes. Number one, it's going to be the description of the arrangement. How is this arrangement like? Okay, we've contracted this entity and they are going to be uh, having rights to operate this asset for 30 years. In return, they are supposed to make an investment of $400 million over the next 10 years to improve upon capacity and they are going to be charging at a price. So all of the details will be there then the significance terms of the arrangement like the period of the concession any repricing date and all that will be disclosed right to use specific assets so all of the details about the service concession must be disclosed in the notes to the financial statement all these must be disclosed to the notes in the financial statement of the entity so that is the issue also about that okay yeah so basically these are the key things that we have to talk about when we deal with public private partnership arrangement these are the key things that we need to really share our thoughts on here like i said the objectives the limitations the importance the key principles the types and then when you take the types even service concession like you are seeing ipsas 32 here giving specific guidelines on how we are supposed to recognize assets under service concession and the disclosures that must be made in the notes to the financial statements these are the key things we must understand when we talk about public private partnership arrangement any questions for me and that brings us to the end of this particular topic so for the purpose of the examination the examiner can come from anywhere for his 10 marks and so the key issues will be the principles very important the limitations very fundamental the issue about the importance or if you want the benefits the objectives the types and the other issues so for the 10 marks either the examiner will bring two of these or just one of them for you to answer any question but that is the general idea about public private partnership in that particular case any questions you put it in the chat for me good day kindly touch on accounting for ppp i think we just spoke about that under ipsas 32 and sure good evening please I downloaded the app in Play Store, but 
find it difficult to register. I don't know what you mean by you are finding it difficult to register generally. Because if you download the app and uh, it's a first time, you are a first time person, you have to register with your name, email address, and details. So if you open the app, you realize that Let's see if I can bring up my screen here. So if you open the app, this is the if you open the app for the first time, this is the screen you're gonna see. Now, if you have already registered on our platform, you have registered before on our website or whatever the heck, then you can put in your email and password, and then you're able to sign in. But you could see below the screen, if you if you look at your app screen. Below the screen, you can see, don't have an account, sign up. You can see that, don't have an account, sign up. So you click on the sign up, and then you put in your name, your email, your selected password that you want to use, your mobile phone number, then you click join. And that will allow you to be able to register, and then you can log in to assess the content in the mobile application. So that is the idea about that and that's coming in from daniel there so it shouldn't be any uh difficulty there like i said if you don't have an account you have never registered on our platform then you just have to sign up uh, by providing your details there then you'll be able to join if you already have an account and you have forgotten your password also on the sign in screen you can see forgot password there um that has been disabled so we w you have to go to our website insurapremium.com and then you'll be able to reset your password on the website then you can come back into the mobile application to um continue all right so that is the idea about that okay so that is what th uh, that's what brings me to the end of the discussion on public-private partnership arrangement. 10 marks area, you want to be prepared for it, go into the exam hall, and then be able to answer the questions in respect of that very well at the end of the day in that regard. So in addition to the public private partnership arrangement like i said in the question four we're going to have public procurement also coming in there and we will see if it is possible for us to take another thing in a subsequent session or in a subsequent period so that we can go through that in that case but that's all about public private partnership arrangement remember again that when it comes to public sector every question will have specific issues for instance if we are looking at question one, we are dealing with the general purpose financial statement. Okay, so we are looking at measurement basis, accounting basis, accounting techniques. These are the primary things that are going to be there. And then the issue about qualitative characteristics of financial statement. So the 20 marks is going to be covering these four areas. Two of them will be in the exam or for the 20 marks. You come to question two, and that is going to be financial statement preparation for the, th that's for the final account or final accounts of the entities. And that could be a covered entity, which is going to be a metropolitan municipal or a district assembly, or it could be a mini ministry department or agency, or it could be on a central government level where we are preparing the final accounts on the consolidated fund. Okay. On the consolidated fund so that is question two, 20 marks and for you to excel there you have to understand revenue management and expenditure control is a key topic in public sector and then number two you have to also understand the ipsas because ipsas 12 is going to be applicable there that is um, inventories ipsas 9 revenue from exchange transaction 
EPSAS 23, revenue from non-exchange transaction. Then there are other EPSAS that will be coming up there for you to understand. EPSAS 17, property plant and equipment is also applicable there, whether I like it or yes. So it's going to be there for you for question two, 20 marks. Question three is going to be the PIFA, 10 marks question on PIFA, and then another 10 mark question on evaluation of financial statements. And that could either be common size analysis, ratio analysis, or budget variance analysis. One of these will be there for 10 marks. And that is question three, 10 marks on PIFA, 10 marks on evaluation of financial statements. PIFA is about analyzing the efficiency and effectiveness of the public financial management system used by the country or b used by the entity so yeah by the country generally so what you want to do is that you can check the playlist on the channel the public sector playlist on the channel and you'll be able to get access to we've covered pifa before in a previous session it's a key lesson make sure you watch that because it's going to be helping you a lot question four is where we're going to have 10 marks on public private partnership arrangement then another 10 marks on public procurement so 10 10 question five is a no man's land area where the examiner is going to be getting excited bringing us questions covering various aspects of the syllabus generally okay covering various aspects of the syllabus which means all other things remaining in the syllabus the role of public offices um budgeting in the public sector name uh, what are the financial provisions uh, or provisions that govern public financial management like any other thing in the syllabus that examiner cannot put into question one question two question three and question four is going to be thrown in question five and so it is important to understand that very well to increase your chances of passing the examination and that is the idea about public sector accounting and finance i'm seeing another chart coming up let's see if i can take that who is this derek good evening uh inshira i'm enjoying your lectures and i'm happy to join you too but i'm a new student at upsa level 100 okay that's great uh i hope that you are doing the ica along with your degree uh, because I think UPSA has that option available uh, because it will be good for you to be doing it alongside. It will require you to just work a little extra, in my opinion. Uh, but it, it's a good thing for you to do so that by the time you graduate with your degree, you are also coming up with your ICA qualification or you may be even done with your ICA qualification or better still wait uh, level 200 or level 300 then you come and take some exemptions then you continue with the ICA but as you're in level 100 I'll comment that hey maybe do it alongside but it all depends it will require you more work but it's great to hear from you uh, Derek Opon Okay, so that is basically the idea about that. And I'm going to be wrapping up here today as we draw the curtains down on the issue in respect of that and see what we can do in the following session. So on Friday at 4.30 p.m., I'm going to be coming your way. Remember that you can follow us on our WhatsApp channel. So on our WhatsApp channel, you'll be able to follow us in Shira Premium and then you get updates for our live stream, updates for our lectures and everything so that you can prepare well for your examination. Thank you very much and I'll catch you on Friday. It will depend on whatever will come up. Friday, it's likely we will do, I don't know, but something will come up because we are looking at the list of the topics that we have received from you guys. And then based on that, we will cover something on Friday. So Friday, I'll be here 4.30 p.m. as we continue with our discussion remember we are in week eight technically we have five more weeks to go that means we have the whole of february to work ourselves out and so whatever it is make sure that you are learning hard you are studying hard to make sure you pass the examination i'll see you on friday as we continue with our discussion